AS Mechanics, Chapter 2, Forces and Motion. So the first thing we're going to look at is force diagrams. It's really, really important that you always draw a diagram before you attempt the question. Some of the questions that we'll be dealing with can be quite wordy and they have a lot of components to them. By drawing a really clear question, you turn those words into a picture and then it is a lot easier to follow. Um, more importantly, it allows us to consider the direction of each force and consider the direction of motion of the particle, which helps you to set up the equations. I know some of you will have done this in physics already. What you've got to understand, the difference between AS Maths Mechanics and physics is physics is coming at it from a theory point of view and we are looking at it from an algebraic point of view. So we're going to insist that you set up these equations in a certain way because of the way that the mark scheme is given during the examination. So if you miss one force out you just get zero marks whereas if you set the first equation up that's where all the marks lie it's really really important that we get that bit right so we will insist on you doing it in a particular way and that that's our reason for it so what we're going to start with um is looking at the different types of arrows that we can use and i would recommend that you use these arrows when you're doing your own diagram just so that you can distinguish between velocity acceleration and a force you will see these diagrams and um, when you're looking at examples in textbooks etc so it's useful for us just to go through so velocity is um, a single arrow acceleration has a double arrow on it and force has got a solid end to it so they're, they're the three arrows that we're looking at the next thing that's really important is to understand the forces that can be applied to a particle. So here I have a particle sat on a horizontal surface. So one of the forces that um, I think is probably the most obvious is going to be the weight. Then to make a particle move, and this I'm touching on Newton's first law here, uh, we have to apply a force, otherwise it just won't move. There's going to be a reason why it's going to move. So if we're looking at the different forces we've got here, so pulling forces and pushing forces are doing the same thing. They're going in the same direction, but in the question they'll be presented differently. So an example of a pulling force is something like tension. That's going to come from a piece of string. The piece of string is fastened to the particle and you pull it along, then you would get tension in your string. And that um, is that pulling force. A thrust um, is very similar but it'll come from having some sort of rigid rod so something that's solid and therefore when you're applying that pushing force you end up with a thrust rather than um, a tension um, you need to recognize the difference between those two resistance so an example of that would be friction so if you've got a rough horizontal surface then there's going to be some sort of um, friction being applied which will be preventing the particle from moving and the one I skipped over there is the normal reaction. And the way to get your head around that, if you just think about it, if there wasn't a force coming up from the table on an object, then the object would have to fall through the table. So the table is stopping that object from doing it. Therefore, there must be a force. And that we, we refer to as a normal reaction. Um, like I've just mentioned, Newton's first law of motion, an object will remain at rest or continue to move with constant velocity unless an unbalanced force acts on the object. OK, so if we apply a tension and we've got friction present, for example, if those two forces are equal, um, then the particle is not moving anywhere. OK, so it has to be that one of those forces is greater in order um, for the particle. To so we've got this key point here. The resultant of any number of forces acting at a point is the single force which has the same effect, i.e. produces the same motion on a small body placed at that point. So key word here is resultant. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. So the resultant. Basically, what that means is it's the sum of the forces. And we've got this these statements down here where it's simplifying the rule. Just try and apply a little bit of common sense. So don't go into a mini meltdown because you don't do physics and you weren't very good at it at high school. This is still AS maths and we can apply a little bit of common sense to it and then apply some algebra and it'll all be fine. So when we're talking about the resultant force, we want to know what the total force is. So if you have a force 
that's pulling in one direction and then you apply a force in the opposite direction if you kind of just think about it in terms of motion that one that's opposing the motion is going to make it harder for the particle to move towards the right if we have the same situation but i apply i've got that force and i apply another force that's going to be helping it so the resultant force is the combination of all these forces that are moving in this this certain direction that we're looking at okay so try not to overcomplicate it when a particle is in equilibrium so another keyword here the resultant force will be zero okay so these are just some key facts to learn so equilibrium um, it means that either the particle is not moving or that we have um, constant velocity in both cases the acceleration will be zero um, but what what you're looking for the key point here is when we're in equ equilibrium that resultant force is equal to zero when you're looking through um, these three points the word magnitude means size so we're talking about the size of the forces so this first one if you've got two forces acting in the same direction the resultant is going to act in the same direction and the size of the resultant force is the sum of the size of the original forces so if we just apply that to part a down here so if i do example 2.1.1 while we're looking at this so we've got two forces we've got three newtons and five newtons both pointing towards the right the resultant force here is three plus five which is eight newtons and that would be acting in the same direction as the original forces okay so part b we've got matches up to this here so for two forces acting in the opposite direction opposite sense the results resultant acts in the sense of the force with the greater magnitude i.e seven is bigger than five so which way is it going to go it's going to go in that direction Okay, so seven is bigger than five. It has to go in that direction. So that's what that bit's saying. So we, we're looking at that idea with the, mag the greater magnitude. We're talking about the bigger number. In terms of the calculation, it's the difference between them. So we've got seven take away five, which is equal to two newtons. So obviously the five is opposing any sort of motion towards the right, and therefore it is making it harder for the particle to move. Okay. C again we're going in the opposite direction this time so we've got nine take away five which is four newtons so your resultant force is four newtons but because nine is bigger than five it will be moving to the left part c for two forces of equal magnitude but of opposite direction the resultant force is zero that is d because if you do four take away four you get zero and that means that we are in equilibrium So that's what's happening there. So we're in equilibrium at that point. OK, so just have a think about that. If, if all these words are being a little bit confusing and it's making it a little bit hard to understand, just have a think through this. It's just common sense. Two forces in the same direction, they're going to help each other. If one is going in the opposite direction, it's going to slow it down. The reason why you need the diagrams is because it is important that you can work out which direction your particle is moving in. So looking at example 2.1.2, horizontal force of magnitude 3 newtons and a vertical force of magnitude 4 newtons are acting at a point 0, find their resultant. So if we were to draw this into a diagram, so what we've got is a, a horizontal force from the origin acting across, which is 3 newtons, and then a vertical force acting upwards which is four newtons and there's the origin so the resultant force that we're talking about looks like that now an easier way to draw the diagram is to draw a nose to tail diagram so if we put one of the forces in it doesn't matter which one you start with you will get the same diagram but i'm just going to go horizontally first so if we put the three newtons in and then when that force is finished we start the next one which is the four newtons what we end up with is the resultant is from start to finish 
goes there. So that's the four newtons up there and the three newtons going across. And because these forces are perpendicular to each other, we have a right angle triangle. So if I want the magnitude of the resultant force, then I'm looking for that length. If that represents length three and that represents length four, then the resultant can be found using Pythagoras' theorem because I've got a right angle triangle. So we've got R squared is equal to four squared plus three squared. So R is root 25. R is equal to five newtons. OK. You can always start off with the square root being on the right hand side of Pythagoras just because the resultant force is always going to be the hypotenuse when we're working with forces that are perpendicular to each other. And we'll look at that in a little bit more detail later. Sometimes, it doesn't mention it here, but sometimes you are asked for the direction. If you're asked for the direction, then it is that angle that you're looking for. And because um, we know the force three and four, it is trigonometry. So we're going to use tan is equal to opposite over adjacent, which gives me tan to the minus one of four over three is equal to theta. So calculating that, we've got 53.1. So we would say that our resultant force, and that's to three significant figures, our resultant force um, is acting at an angle of 53.1 above the horizontal. So moving on from there, if we've got several forces acting at a point, the component of their resultant in a particular direction is the sum of the components of the separate forces in that direction. So what we're going to be looking at here is the x direction is going to be going in to the right and the y direction is going to be going up. So we're going to be looking at the components of x and y. And when we get on to um, some of the more complicated questions, it all comes down to this. If you can do 2.1.3, you've almost cracked the whole chapter. So this is really important and it's worth spending some time on. So having a look at this, I'm going to split it up in the x direction. So I've got 6 minus 4, which is 2. And the 6 is bigger than the 4, so that's going to be going to the right. In the y direction, I've got 8 minus 3, which is 5. And the 8 is bigger than the 3, so that's going to be going up. I recommend that you pause the video now and work through B, C, D, and then just check in with your answers. So B, we've got X. 7 to 8, 3 is equal to 4 newtons, and that's going to be going to the left. And Y, we've got 6 minus 2 is also equal to 4 newtons, and that one is going up. Make sure you've got those directions right, because that is the key. Looking at part C, I've got 8 minus 2, which is 6 newtons left. 5 minus 3, 2 newtons down. D, 5 minus 3, 2 newtons right. 2 minus 1 is one newton down.